Welcome everyone to the webinar on gender-based violence, a global health challenge. I am Maria Kusa, the division manager of the GHI Academy. The Academy is the capacity building arm of the Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut. This is the third and last installment of the webinar series on gender and global health. The webinar will be delivered by Ms. Lina Abu Habib. Lina is the Executive Director of Women's Learning Partnership and Senior Advisor to the Collective for Research and Training on Development Action, which promotes women's leadership, political participation, and citizenship uh, and economic rights in Lebanon and the MENA region. Lina is the co-founder and coordinator of the Mashrik Maghrib Gender Linking and Information Project. She has collaborated with a number of regional and international agencies, as well as public institutions in mainstreaming gender and development uh, policies and practices and in building capacity for gender mainstreaming. She is a former chair of the board of the Association for Women's Rights and Development, and she currently is a MENA advisor for the Global Fund for Women and on the editorial board of Oxfam's journal on gender and development. So Lina will be delivering her presentation. Uh, there will be poll questions throughout the presentations and I would like to encourage you all to participate in these poll questions. Uh, this will then be followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. So please feel free to type in your questions as we move along the presentation. Uh, without further ado, Lina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. This is very exciting. I have to say I'm a novice at uh, uh, delivering a webinar. Um, Usually, it's more. Uh, I'm more into face-to-face -face interactions. So, um, so I have. I, I hope nobody would mind if there are any technical glitches with me. Bear with me. So, uh, so our conversation today is about gender-based violence as a global health challenge. And um, the way I would like to address it, first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do. Um, and then I want to move straight on into a global research that we have done with the support of IDRC on uh, the link between family laws and gender-based violence and global initiative to address this issue, which we certainly consider as being uh, global. So what is the uh, Women's Learning uh, Partnership? At the end of my talk, uh, we will leave you with uh, some resources um, uh, to, 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 uh, to review on the Women Learning Partnership. But meanwhile, I will just say that we are a partnership, as the name indicates, of 20 autonomous women's rights organizations throughout the Global South, from the MENA region, from East and West Africa, from Latin America, from Southeast Asia, and from Central Asia. Um, our work is aims at... Um, changing, shifting the nature of human relations, the architecture of human relations. And in doing so, what we do is, is we, pr we promote participatory women's leadership, civic engagement, and human rights. WLP, or the Women's, right, women's Learning Partnership, is an international nonprofit, non-governmental organization. And we work with men and women at every level, both uh, at the community level, as leaders, in different social institutions, being educational institutions, market institutions, or government institutions. Um, let me go head on into that, uh, that, uh, that research. And um, um, this is where I'm gonna take most of, my, most of my time. What is it that we were uh, trying to do? Um, the idea, the hypothesis, the main assumption is that there's a very intricate link uh, actually an intimate link between family laws, and I will describe in a line of why, in a short while what I mean by family laws, and what we know as various forms of uh, violence against women. This is not uh, um, a legal endeavor of any kind. This is about understanding how, uh, how social and women movement went about to reform family laws so that by reforming family laws, we are able to address global issues such as a global, a, global, a global problem, I would say a global epidemic, which is uh, uh, gender-based uh, gender violence. Um, so, the, so the idea in terms of what, the, what, the, what that research is about, uh, um, again, it's to look at 
how as women, as activists, as women wanting to address the global issue of gender-based violence, we have gone into the strategy of reforming, uh, of reforming family laws so that non-discriminatory po uh, policies could, could come about and so that we would actually challenge the legal and social justifications for gender-based uh, for gender-based violence, we've done this through doing in-depth case studies of eleven. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a mistake on the slide. Eleven countries from the global south, not Arab, not Arab countries. Eleven countries from the global south, uh, where we looked at um, the history of uh, family laws. How does it how does it impact uh, gender equality and legislation, and what are the repercussions at the level of gender based violence? Um, I think I've I've gone through uh, your previous uh, webinars, and the definition of gender based violence has has been framed very well. So I will not go I will not go into I will not go into this. Um, looking at eleven diverse countries. Um, and at the end, end of my at the end of my uh, uh, webinar, uh, I will give you uh, some instructions as to how to go and and, and read that uh, research in depth. So, looking at uh, 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 at these eleven diverse countries, we have been able to pull some findings, some common findings. Even though I have to say it's incredibly challenging, complex, and complicated to, uh, to be able to draw similarities or to be able to even compare between 11, uh, 11 uh, countries. Okay, so what did we find actually? Well, uh, not surprisingly, legislation that is discriminatory, such as the case of family laws, actually is the main cause that prevent women from accessing their human rights. Preventing women from accessing their human rights means preventing women from exercising agency over themselves and over their bodies, but also it means um, uh, it means making women vulnerable to all forms of oppression, discrimination, and uh, uh, violence. Uh, there's also an intimate link between the process, a process of patriarchal, hierarchical, top-down decision making. Uh, uh, structures which are actually embedded in most of our most of our uh, societies, and these structures of oppressive patriarchal decision making actually happen within the uh, what we call the private sphere or the realms of the household, but are actually reproduced in the public sphere, be it in uh, be, be it be it in educational institutions being at work in the world of work or even uh, and definitely actually in uh, uh, in politics our third finding uh, our, uh, uh, was that family laws and violence are intimately linked which actually came to uh, uh, validate our uh, our initial assumption to start with so wherever family laws were discriminatory immediately they were either condoned, facilitate, or encourage gender-based violence. And that is the main problem that women are facing world, worldwide. Um, these family laws, uh, uh, not just in the 11 countries that we've studied, but also globally, are essentially either religious uh, in themselves or derived from uh, from uh, from uh, from religion mm -hmm. therefore the difficulty in uh, the difficulty in bringing about change the dif the difficult yes but not impossible and this i'll come to it uh, i'll come to it later so legal so, so so unseating or challenging or breaking down religious practices the discriminatory practices which are told, which we are told are religiously sa sanctioned, is, is, is actually a challenge that all of these countries, uh, all of these countries face. Um, however, and this relates to the last two points on this, uh, on this slide, the reform that activists, that feminist activists and women activists uh, uh, looked at were actually pa two, two parallel strategies of reforms. One is looking at the legal text, essentially, of course, but the other was 
uh, unpacking, breaking down, uh, uh, creating wedges, and shaking the cultural and traditional foundations of gender roles and gender, uh, gender stereotypes, and uh, um, the way the, 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 the position of women in society in the mindset, because the fact that women are seen as subordinate or submissive to men is, is both, both embedded in the letter of the law and in cultural practices and what, quote unquote what we call cultural practices and traditional practices, which means that work was done by feminist activists at two levels. Uh, let, me, let me just continue briefly. Um, I see that time is running, but one thing we found, which was a very, very interesting conclusion uh, in, uh, 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 in our study, is, uh, is that there have been successful reforms. There have been successful reforms which have had positive impact on challenging or addressing gender-based violence. These, what made, most of the time, what made these successful reforms possible was actually that they happened in a context where, the, where democracy was understood as being driven by gender equality, where they were part of a package of democratic reform, which was a very, very interesting uh, uh, and compelling finding for us. When, is, when are uh, uh, struggles for reform successful? Obviously, they were part of a package of what we call uh, democratic democratic reforms. Um, the other thing, of course, again, uh, 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 it was good to find evidence about it, is that that kind of uh, activism is actually very successful in environments that are conducive to civil activism, to civic activism, to a practice of participatory, participatory, uh, 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 participatory leadership, participatory democratic. Um, and the last point I want to say here is, um, when we looked at the various forms of gender-based violence, uh, that were made possible because, because of uh, uh, family laws that, as I said, or the, either facilitate or condone uh, uh, or do not sanction uh, family laws. We, f we, we found obviously that the main aim is actually to, uh, to be able to control women and girls. The, the, the idea was amongst the perpetrator is to condone, uh, is to control women and girls. Uh, I'm gonna come back to this slide later. I'm just a little bit mindful of time. Just want to, um, I, want to I want to come back to some uh, facts and figures about gender-based violence, which are, I think, not only compelling, but actually, actually quite scary. Uh, you know the the the, uh, the one in three uh, uh, the one in three that we use all the time one woman in th one in three women has experienced physical or sexual assault most of the time by an intimate uh, partner is actually a global finding um, we have had small uh, 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 small studies in different parts of the world um, everything comes down to a one in three. It's a terrifying magic number. Uh, and I have to say that over the, the last, uh, over the last few decades, we haven't been able to change it yet. The forms that we, that we have found, which are again, and, and again, condoned by, uh, or facilitated, made possible by, by family laws is the whole issue of child marriage. Uh, the most compelling figure is 750 million women and girls alive we're not talking about those who died. Uh, today, as we speak, they were married forcefully before their 18th birthday. Um, the, other, uh, uh, the other major issue related to, uh, 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 to gender-based violence, again, again uh, at least not stopped by law, not sanctioned by law, is the fact that 200 million women and girls globally, as we speak, have actually uh, uh, been subjected to uh, uh, female ge genital uh, mutilation. Um, again, let me, f let, me go, let me go through some other uh, uh, 
uh, horrific uh, facts. One of which, and I'm afraid to say uh, that uh, most of this figure comes from my region, from the MENA region. Every year, 5,000 girls and women are actually um, uh, killed in the name of honor through crimes that are called honor crimes. Uh, of course, the use of honor crimes is a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, that's the way the law calls it. We're going to say, some will say, but this is the penal code. These are not family laws. Well, this is how the legal, uh, uh, this is how family laws also infiltrate other laws which are non-religious, other civil laws, namely the penal code, uh, uh, labor laws, uh, uh, etc. Et um, I'm going to skip the rest of these figures. You can, you can, you can, you can consult them later because um, actually it's difficult to choose which ones we're going to share because um, because that gender-based violence and the intimate link between laws that make them possible are actually um, uh, in, are actually comprehensive. They relate to all aspects of, uh, uh, of, of, of life. I want to just, um, uh, uh, a new figure, I found a new figure uh, um, quite uh, alarming from UNFPA, which, uh, which um, um, in, in 2018, which actually shows us that even women themselves justify gender-based violence. And this tells you how much a patriarchy and the ways in which patriarchy uh, uh, um, infiltrates our lives through laws and through practices, how much we have ownership of, of these values so that women themselves justify what we call wife beating or domestic, uh, domestic violence. Okay, so... Um, one of so the other aspect we looked at uh, since the law is an issue, since uh, law is intimately linked to gender-based violence. Okay, what are the three issues in relation to access to justice? If we assume that as access to women's access to justice is actually one way to address gender-based violence uh, uh, in 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 this case, well. One aspect that was common in all our, uh, our countries, in all our case studies uh, countries, was that, of course, protecting uh, women needs, 100% needs improving laws and improving policies, but also raising awareness. And I want, to, I want us to look at this uh, and, to, and to compare it with the figure that we just uh, looked at from UNFPA. On the one hand, the laws themselves and social policies need to be uh, reframed within, uh, within a view toward gender equality, protection, and ensuring full citizenship of, of women and men. But on the other hand, uh, the other shift that we're looking toward is a shift in awareness vis-a-vis -vis vis -vis making, making gender-based violence unacceptable socially, morally, culturally, and as a, as a value. Okay. Um, the, other, uh, the other form of reform, if I may say, is strengthening, strengthening institutional responses to gender. What does, it, what does strength, strengthening institutional responses? Meaning that the judiciary has the, has, the, has the text, the tools, the mechanisms, and the way to address gender-based violence, Me meaning that the law enforcement has, has this as well, meaning that there are safe spaces for women to go to, meaning that there are institutions who are there to protect, but also to uh, provide services for women victims of gender-based violence. And of course, um, one the, the, the other thing which um, it, which is a taboo issue. We don't like to talk about it. You know, we really like to talk now more and more about working with boys and men uh, 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 to address gender-based violence. And that seems to be the narrative worldwide. Let's see how to include boys and men in that, uh, in that conversation. Yes, of course. But nevertheless, what we, th what we uh, 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 found worked as well or even better is actually that the cost of 
the cost to men and boys engaging in, in, in violence needs to be increased. It need, we need to, our mindset needs to shift to consider gender-based violence a crime and therefore deserving criminal sanctions and, and not only uh, uh, um, an engagement in a dialogue with uh, men uh, and boys. And again, I realize that this is um, that this is not a comfortable issue to talk about. Uh, let me um, um, let me let me talk a little bit about some of the the ways in which we've chosen to address this on the ground, aside from the from the from the research. It's very important for when activists engage, uh, such as uh, uh, such as the Women's Learning Partnership, the ways we have. Uh, uh, dealt with, engaged with, in addition to research, the research that I described to you, in addition to advocacy, which is the advocacy that I described to you, is actually to work uh, uh, to address uh, 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 women themselves, women being either leaders in their communities or women being uh, 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 um, uh, advocates, leaders, uh, uh, practitioners in other uh, organizations. Um, one of the things we have produced and which I really invite you to, uh, to peruse is our manual on victories over violence. Why is it called victory over violence? Because we want to make the point that we can have victories over violence. This manual, the, 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 the aim of this manual is to contribute to ensuring safety for women and girls through building capacities, through knowledge, through the provision of tools that would make women we work with, girl we work with, A, refuse uh, the concept of gender-based violence, so not accept it as a values, and actually decide to do something, uh, to do something about it. Um, so, um, having, 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 having looked at uh, one aspect of intervention, which is uh, looking specifically at uh, 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 how we empower women and girls to have what we call victories over, over violence. Um, we look a little bit at the work that is being done on changing uh, the laws. Is it challenging? Of course it is challenging. Is it, does, it, does it happen fast? It doesn't happen fast. It takes not years, but it takes decades. And the, way, the reason why it's difficult. It takes decades. Uh, it may not happen the way we want it. We really do not need to despair. Is because one, um, gender-based violence is being like it or not. And I know that uh, 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 this is again a narrative that may not be too uh, popular. It is justified as a cultural and or religious and or traditional uh, practice, which we have made it, or patriarchy has made it integr integral to the history and the identity of our society. And therefore, this is what it means, changing the law, meaning changing the whole way we've constructed this society, the way we've constructed it to be top down, the way we've constructed it with a clear view of who's on top and who owns who. The second reason is, uh, Let's face it, let's look at our legal systems, let's look, let's look at politi our political system, and let's see how many women we, are, we have in these systems, where are they, what is their agenda? And of course, the, realize, the sad realization is that women are, I don't want to say absent, but um, I will definitely say they have less access to political legal system where decisions are made, they have less access uh, 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 than men. And of course, the, the, the third reason is um, uh, uh, the endemic problems of resources, because changing the letter of the law is one thing, implementing it, enforcing it is another thing, which it requires quite a lot of resources. Requiring quite a lot of resources, meaning, meaning the political will to shift resources from one thing and to put it here. And that it, what, 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 this is what feminist activism around uh, uh, family law reform in order to address gender-based violence have found the most difficult, shifting resources to address uh, family law reforms and address gender-based violence. Okay, so at the end of the day, we're talking about two things. 
if we want to address gender-based violence as a global issue. Number one, new laws, enactment of new laws. Enactment of new laws means, um, and I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to uh, expand, means making sure we have laws that one, condemn the gender-based violence, and two, give responsibility to the state to prevent and protect women from gender-based violence. So it's actually bringing, uh, uh, bringing, bringing the issue of uh, uh, gender-based violence to the public sphere as a responsibility of the state and saying that women are women, whether they are within their ho households or whether they are in the, in, the, in, 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 in the public sphere. And the second thing, which uh, the second strand in terms of changing mindset is actually what we call educating for safety and peace. Uh, and, for, uh, and for feminist, peace for us, it doesn't only mean peace from conflict. It means peace in human relations, peace in the household, peace, peace on the street, uh, making sure that women are not, at ev women and girls are not at every single moment of their lives subjected, vulnerable and subjected to different forms of gender-based violence. Uh, I want to end by um, just going through a few links uh, that you might find find uh, find useful. Uh, the manual "Victories Over Violence" uh, is access accessible to you through this link. Again, it's a very um, uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's a very comprehensive manual. The purpose of it is to work with practitioners so that they are able to work with women. Uh, to change mindsets on violence against women, on gender-based violence, but also to do something about it. From the, the, this manual is accompanied by a really compelling and strong uh, video from Fear to, to Freedom, and it's exactly as the name indicates. Um, and it's, it, gives, it gives you a series of narratives throughout the world how we have been able to move from fear to, pre to, to freedom. Um, I would like you to. I would like to draw your attention to the third uh, resource, the third video. Uh, it's called "Equality: It's All in the Family," and this is where we argue that the source of equality or inequality, and the source, the beginning of the experience of gender-based violence, is at the household, no matter where the household the household is. Uh, what, I, what, what I need to specify before I, before I close is that gender-based violence is not culture-specific, country-specific, continent-specific. It's actually specific to a certain form of viewing society as being patriarchal, and that uh, uh, mindset, that formatting starts within the household. Uh, and the last, uh, the last uh, uh, link is to our whole research uh, again, which is uh, supported by, which was supported by uh, Canadian IDRC, and where you will find uh, all our case studies, the analysis of the eleven countries, uh, but also um, a, a, a beautiful uh, introductory and a beautiful closing chapter, which brings us back to the whole argument of why gender-based violence is actually a global issue and not uh, uh, not not time or or space specific um, thank you very much uh, I think um, uh, I think uh, uh, I've got all of my uh, all of my uh, um, slides so do we have any questions Maria uh, so before the questions, I'm just going to start by sharing the results uh, of the poll questions. So among those who responded to the first polls, uh, which was on GB, uh, GBV is deeply rooted in behavior, in behavior and what we define as culture, and hence it is difficult to challenge. So 95% of the respondents uh, responded as yes, and 14% responded no. Uh, for the second poll, uh, GBV is a localized issue and needs local rather than global solutions. Among the respondents, 33% responded as yes and 67% responded uh, as no. 
And the last poll uh, on positive atti uh, attitudinal shifts will result in changes on perception of GBV. 100% uh, of respondents uh, responded as yes. So okay. uh, these are the results uh, of, of the poll. Um, and in terms of questions, so the first question is from uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and the question is, there are a number of interventions to GBV. What really works and what works? Um, okay. Should I go for the second question or should we start by responding to this Let question? Me yeah, let me respond to let me respond to to the first one. Um, it's actually a thesis, not just a question. <laughs> Indeed, there are several, there are I mean innumerable uh, uh, interventions addressing GBV, uh, and I don't think the the uh, I don't think we can classify this as works partly work or doesn't work. We really need to uh, frame frame them. First of all, are we addressing the root causes of GBV? In our view, the root cause of GBV are actually two. One, legal texts that are either insufficient or they make it possible, or legal texts that are straightforward patriarchal. And then a certain mindset, a certain uh, 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 behavior and attitude uh, and practices that do that actually condone GBV, and all of this comes from the idea of where are women situated, what is the political position of women and girls in a society, uh, and we go back to the issue of control. So, in terms of in terms of mm -hmm. intervention, therefore. The number one, uh, uh, the number one intervention is attacking uh, the text themselves, and I'm really happy to see that we are now in a place where uh, reforming family laws, bringing in new, uh, bringing in new uh, 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 text, or even challenging. Uh, text based on religion is no longer a taboo. I mean, here in Lebanon. Uh, uh, our colleagues in uh, um, uh, a very well-known NGO working on uh, uh, on gender-based violence called CAFA have been able to make an enormous breakthrough in a new law, uh, in a new law that safeguards what the, the what the Parliament decided to call uh, family members from uh, from fam from family violence. And they are now pushing to the parliament new uh, changes to the to the to the to the law. So, number one number one uh, uh, intervention. We cannot live in 2019, coming up to 2020, with laws that are archaic, with laws that do not embrace full gender equality, and with laws that do not uh, make the state responsible for the protection of its citizen. Number one. Number two. The interventions that matter and that, re, that, that also matter and that need to be done on a daily basis is actually uh, challenging our own mindsets, challenging the ways we were raised to accept what is a man and what is a woman, to accept what does it mean to have a masculine behavior and what does it mean to have feminine behavior, but, also, but actually to change it into this uh, epiphany of being citizens that have the rights to have rights, citizens that have the right to be protected from violence, citizens that do not have to, you know, uh, uh, wait to see by chance if yes or no, they will be. So that's awareness, that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of education, which starts, which which has to happen everywhere, is another uh, uh, intervention, and then. Uh, and then uh, lastly is actually this the whole issue of services and protection uh, 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 and systems that actually work in uh, criminalizing uh, perpetrators and in protecting victims and survivors. So that would be my, my answer to, to the first question. Thank you. Uh, so Fatima has three questions. I'll uh, read them all. 
So from your expert knowledge, what are the historical roots for patriarchal structures that women at higher risk for GBV, GBV and particularly in the Middle East? Uh, the second question is, can you comment on the intersection of gender and war, specifically GBV in armed conflict settings? And the third question is, do you happen to have studied GBV in the Syrian conflict? If so, what is the size, scope of the problem? And what are the exacerbating and or protective factors for GBV in that context? Okay, again, oh my God, uh, I think each of these questions is a webinar uh, uh, of its own, but let me just try to be, <laughs> let me try, let me try to be, to be brief. Um, uh, Oh my goodness! Uh, what I want to say for the first part of the of the of the of the question is, uh, I really don't think we can say um, we can safely say um, women in this particular region region uh, have a higher risk for GBV. Um, I mean, there might be, uh, uh, the indicators might be more alarming, might be higher, et cetera. But it's very important for us to understand that patriarchy and gender-based violence go hand in hand, number one. The number two that we need to remember is that there are various forms of gender-based violence, um, which we're not going to go through uh, now because it has been covered in the previous in the previous. Uh, um, in the previous uh, uh, webinars. So gender-based violence is global. The way it is manifested is local. So you may, so, so you may have honor crimes in, 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 one, in, one, uh, in one country, uh, female uh, FGM in another country, uh, uh, various forms of uh, rape and harassment in another place or a, or a, or a, or a or a, or a combination of uh, uh, of all. Um, going into the historical root of the patriarchal uh, system, I think is a little bit beyond this uh, this discussion. But what make women, what makes women at higher risk for GBVs are inadequate laws, archaic laws, uh, and um, uh, um, um, Again, I, I, I do not like to, to, to use the word culture, but I would say cultural practices and traditions that view women as subordinate, subservient to men. Um, okay, uh, the second and I think third questions are quite uh, related. Yes, conflict, any form of conflict, um, the impact of conflict is not gender neutral. Impact of conflict is gendered in a sense that women and girls experience conflict differently than men and boys. Uh, differently because our starting point is gender inequality. And you're adding on this, uh, on these unequal relations, you are adding the factor, the, the, the conflict factor. So what is happening for instance, and with this, uh, what is happening in the, uh, um, what is happening in the Syrian conflict. What is happening in the Syrian conflict is actually, and unfortunately, a repeat of what has happened in, whether in, in, in Rwanda or in Afghanistan or in any other uh, uh, conflict. Number one, increased practices of violence uh, uh, against women in the form of trafficking, in the form of, uh, uh, in the form of forced marriage, child marriages, in the form of forced prostitution. Number two, increased burden on women in terms of livelihood care in the absence of any kind of uh, protection or adequate, uh, uh, adequate, uh, adequate services. Um, uh, the fact that our response to conflict anywhere in the world, for some reason, still hasn't absorbed that these things will happen to women and girls in any conflict is seriously problematic. Uh, and actually, one fails to understand it. One fails to understand uh, uh, why we haven't learned from previous conflicts. One fails to understand that uh, immediately as displacement occurs, immediately as women and girls are driven out of their home, 
uh, these things will all of this uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, problems are going to 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 come so what I would say very quickly um, um, is uh, um, Gen gender, uh, uh, the gendered impact of conflict, the number one uh, uh, result is various forms of gender-specific violence against women and girls. So sh shall we go, yes, so the okay. next, yes, the next question is, uh, if there are no safeguarding protocols, how can healthcare providers identify and address gender-based violence at facility and community levels? Uh, to, to, to tell you the honest truth, uh, um, uh, it's very difficult actually without protocols, without a policy that as a healthcare provider, one of your main uh, one of your main uh, 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 tasks and responsibility is to be able to address, uh, to recognize, to address and to refer cases of gender-based violence. It's incredibly difficult to, 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 to do it. So let me just give you an example. So you're a dispensary in one place or the other, okay? Uh, let's say you have recognized the case. If you have no reference system, and by reference system, I mean two things, either or, or together, services, or actually law enforcement, there's practically nothing you can do. And that is why we're saying the solution is not just at the level of awareness raising, but making the laws work, change to work in the case of gender-based violence, but also making the services available, the right services for protection and safety available. Wonderful. So we have a lot of questions coming in, but we're, we're only able to take two more questions. So maybe I can read, uh, read all of the questions and we can have, uh, either you, you can take the conversation offline or we, we can quickly go over them. So. The first one is, I'm especially interested in interventions specifically targeting children and adolescents regarding GBV and the influence of GBV on child and adolescent health globally. Can you comment on that? Uh, the next question is, uh, how can the proposed change, meaning improving the, uh, could work work in settings where people are stateless or are not part of the political process of a state? Example, refugees and yes. the gates, Palestinian um, conflict. Yes. Uh, the, th the next question is, given patriarchal uh, structures favor and provide resource, uh, resources for men, when GBV is taking place, women in communities where I live are disempowered to report even when abuse of themselves. Uh, is criminalization the only answers? What can be done as uh, an intervention in these situations? And the last okay. question is, in your opinion, is GBV accurately uh, quantified in EMR countries? Is it underestimated or underreported in light of the lack of system systematic documentation of GBV psychological and physical injuries at medical facilities? I'm sorry, that was a burst uh, of uh, question. No, that's fine. Actually, I'll, uh, you know, you're right. Let me take two questions. Uh, I mean, all the questions are very relevant, but let me just take two in the, uh, in the interest of... I'm going to take the question on uh, uh, settings where people are stateless. That's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent remark. Um, Yes, that is that is a serious, serious issue. I'm gonna again, if you allow me, uh, and if if the participant would allow me, I will take the example of Lebanon, in terms of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, in refugees, uh, in refugee, in refugee camps. Um, what has happened? Uh, uh, what has happened in the situation? Well, first of all, we need to look at the context and the histor historical changes in the context. In this country. Uh, we have started to talk about gender-based violence actually, or actually around uh, the Beijing Conference on Women. So 
truly, if you look at the literature and if you look at the, at the published literature, literature and the gray literature, you're going to find very little mention of gender-based violence. It's only after 1995 that, you know, we had uh, 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 really a very, uh, uh, very robust uh, new organization, uh, again, that I, I just mentioned, uh, CAFA, which actually created a momentum uh, and worked for over, actually worked for something like 20 years to get a law enacted. And that law is there. Is it there for Lebanese women or is it there for women in Lebanon? Uh, that's actually a, a, a uh, that's actually a big question mark. Um, I don't think, and I agree with the, uh, uh, with the person who asked it, I don't think it works equally for other women in Lebanon who are not Lebanese, especially, especially refugees. Because the whole issue of do they have, rec do they have legal recourse is not, uh, is not there. The legal recourse is not there and therefore the services are not there. And what happened recently is that women organizations, feminist organizations working with within Palestinian camps have brought about this, uh, this issue in a sense uh, at different levels. So one trying to do some documentation and reporting. And by the way, the reports from that that were issued based on, based on field studies in Palestinian camps also came up with the one, one in three figure. Um, and as a result, also started providing some services. But again, uh, um, the structure of law enforcement, the idea and structure of law enforcement and mechanism for law enforcement, and even direct services such as um, shelters within the confine of refugee camps is almost uh, non-existent. So, so the organizations active and really wanted, wanting to do something on gender-based violence are actually going through the route of uh, awareness raising and community engagement and you know, working with local champions and, uh, uh, um, and so on. That is exactly the situation that is facing Syrian, displa Syrian displaced in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. And I think um, to, the, to the person who has uh, um, uh, uh, to the person who has uh, asked this question, let's remember that um, the, whole, the, the, the the plethora of problems coming with statelessness. One of this, one of one, uh, an important one of these problems is the inability to protect uh, women, uh, uh, to protect them from uh, from from uh, from violence. So that was one question that I wanted to. Um, that I wanted to answer. The other, the other question um, is, is GBV accurately quantified in EMR countries? Uh, interesting. Um, let's, let me say something again. Uh, let's, re let's remember that we have gone from a situation where we had no data at all because gender-based violence was a non-issue and therefore there's no data and therefore it, there's a vicious circle of it remaining invisible to a situation of recognition and reporting. Um, and what is helping also is in some of our countries in the EMR region, some form of uh, legal reform that has transpired into better uh, reporting and more awareness at the level at the level uh, uh, at the level of uh, uh, recording and quantifying uh, gender based violence uh, honestly is it underestimated or under reporting i would like to say yes uh, but in truth i don't know um, i can only say with confidence that we are in a situation where we have data. Uh, we, have, we have a starting point. We have baselines. Is it enough? No. Should it be improved? Of course it should be. Uh, of course it should be improved. Uh, and, but, 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 but I think, um, 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 and I want to conclude here on the issue of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of data. 
data means we're recognizing something. And for us, in terms of both governments, civil society, UN, uh, other uh, actors and stakeholders, to have recognized this as a public and political issue is a great shift. And that's why we're starting to have this, this data. Uh, and I want to you know, conclude by saying, uh, thanks to feminist activism around this, the whole um, very difficult road and very difficult journey toward, toward, uh, toward reform has indeed started. And we have started to have serious indicators about it. And I think at this stage, let's worry about improving what we have uh, rather than trying to think, you know, maybe it's not enough. I think it's, it's our collective efforts that are needed here to improve what we, to improve what we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for the questions and for such an engaging webinar. I'd like to encourage you all, maybe Lina, if you can show the last slide that, that has your contact information. So in case you would want to uh, reach out for any questions uh, to keep the conversation going, we'd like to encourage you to do that. Uh, we'd like to also encourage you to keep monitoring our offerings. So we will ha be having uh, webinars uh, in the near future. Um, again, Dina, thank you so much for, for joining us today and for such an interesting and informative presentation. And we look forward uh, to having you again. Um, perfect. So thank you, everyone. Thank you and goodbye.